Ladies and gentlemen, Cat, Cat Sykes, everyone. question i don't know which one there she's go. in she's manually yeah, yeah i'm on at the moment do we have any tape hello and pen that's a good question pen will oh no hmm? you can tell i work with technology every day Some glasses on. Oh, okay. Good now. I mean, as a man's union, I thought I would be louder. But. Hello? Yeah, it's definitely at me. Sorry. Good. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm definitely much louder now. So. Hello, welcome everybody in person. I will pre-warn absolutely everybody that this is the first time I have ever done anything like this at all. So I chose all you lovely people at Eastside Newcastle to do this talk. So Sam, uh, no Sam, you're Sam, you're Chris. <laughs> Start well. <laughs> uh, that was absolutely fantastic, but I will be have nowhere near as many terrifying stories as Chris did. But Yes, I just like to freak people out with the title Ransomware APTs versus Vulnerabilities. Oh, oh are we getting any? I threw up the slides. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. I fixed it eventually. So, over the course of this talk, I will walk through three case studies of real life ransomware attacks that have occurred in 2021. But as of 2020, researchers have estimated the cost of rectifying a ransomware attack to be just shy of $2 million. And according to industry predictions, one ransomware attack actually occurs every 11 seconds. Up from once every 14 seconds in 2019. So just over the course of this talk, there will probably be around 180 to 190 ransomware attacks alone. So a good way to start is absolutely terrifying everyone. So when we talk about ransomware attacks, we usually do talk about them in terms of threat groups and advanced persistent threat actors who have had the motivation in order to attack those organizations in questions. This isn't always, I'm not saying it is, but everyone needs a name for the talk, right? So this focus on linting incidents that we all read about and regularly read about in mainstream news and linking them to a particular threat group. I will probably argue throughout the, 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 this talk in general is actually becoming a bit of a moot point, really. Because when ransomware itself works on vulnerabilities, you know, do we keep continually talking about the ransomware groups in the background? So what would happen if we actually encouraged the conversation around ransomware to change, and instead of purely focusing on the threat actors and the tools, techniques, and procedures that they use to attack organizations, we actually encourage companies and the security teams to focus on the actual problem, the vulnerabilities that are currently being used, talked about, and readily weaponized. Because let's face it, threat actors will target anything that they can get their hands on. So as I said right at the top of the call, at the top of the call, used to Zoom, uh, at the top of the um, presentation, I will walk through three case studies of attacks that happened just over the course of 2021. The focus of these case studies is generally to provide a bit of an insight 
into talking about the weaknesses that have been exploited by those threat groups in question in order to gain access to the systems. So using these, I will present a bit of a different way that we can start to think about the way that we essentially secure the organisations that are currently being targeted by these threat actors. So diving straight first into our first case study on the 6th of May 2021 Colonial Pipeline, who just happened to be the largest fuel pipeline in the United States, carrying 45% of the East Coast supply of diesel, petrol and even jet fuel, experienced a ransomware attack that is leading leaked to the threat group Darkside. Darkside operators stole roughly 100 gigabytes of company files from the systems in what's believed to be just under two hours. Data included names, contact information, date of birth, government issued identification, and even health related information of around 5,810 individuals. Colonial Pipeline themselves actually paid $4.4 million in ransom to the group in order to restore the service quickly, of which the Department of Justice, following a quite a bit of hefty analysis and research and pulling back, did manage to seize $2.3 million in cryptocurrency. So concentrating on the group itself, dark side who are known to have targeted Colonial Pipeline have operated since 2018, ignore that that's on there, uh, and shut down its operations following the Colonial Pipeline attack in 2021. Though, just like many groups that we continuously read about, they have just rebadged to another group, in this case, Black Matter. So Darkside and its affiliates have been known to gain initial network access by exploiting vulnerable software exposed to the internet, including things like Citrix, remote desktop web, and remote desktop protocol moving from gaining that initial access to moving laterally throughout the company network, inevitably looking for and removing any sensitive data that is of interest to them. Several threat groups have actually been linked to exploiting one particular vulnerability in Citrix, labelled as CVE 2019-19781, which is actually a flaw in Citrix application delivery controller gateway and SD1 one-up products, namely a suite of products that is used to deliver purpose-built net networking appliances uh, to improve the performance, security and resiliency of applications delivered over the web. The vulnerability in Citrix, if exploited, does actually allow a threat actor to gain access to sensitive code or data that is present on the server that is running the application, but of course, it's dependent on the network setup. Critically, the exploitation of the vulnerability is based on exposure to the internet. Additionally, the National Institute of Standards and Technology have actually warned multiple times about the vulnerability in Citrix, with the last warning actually released on the 31st of December, 2020, and have again urged that it's a critical vulnerability that needs to be patched. The first proof of concept exploit for the code was published on GitHub, actually just one day before an attack occurred on the United States Census Bureau in January 2020. More recently, and actually more importantly to our point, threat actors continue to indicate their preference for exploiting Citrix and this particular CVE in the forums between January 2020 and March 2021, with it being the top mentioned CVE in both Russian and English speaking dark web forums. Swiftly moving on to our second case study, French multinational firm AXA were identified a ransomware attack on the 17th of May this year that appeared to be impacting branches of the firm based in Thailand, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. The Abaddon ransomware group actually claimed credit for the attack 
and posted on their data leak site that they had gained access to around three terabytes of sensitive information from the customer systems. Similar to the first one that was just walked through, that was a whole host of sensitive information, including things like customer medical reports, identification cards, bank account statements, amongst so much more. AXA didn't actually mention how much the ransom was that the group had posted to them, but from analysis of the group themselves, we do know that this was at least between $40,000 and $600,000. Turning our attention to the group themselves, they've known to operate it between February 2020 and June 2021 turn into a ransomware as a service model in June 2020. But I won't mention that now, I'll mention it a little later in the presentation just to keep everybody in suspense as to what that is. During its periods of operations, researchers believe the group have targeted and impacted into a whole host of degrees around 2,934 organisations. However, you probably would never know it because many of these didn't actually reach the mainstream media, only a handful did, including AXA that we've just talked about. Avada and its affiliates have been associated with targeting exposed remote desktop service connections to provide a very basic understanding of what that is and to not patronize anybody in the audience and apologies to any networkers. This is essentially allows a local computer to establish a link with a computer to, in order to gain full or restricted access to that computer of choice and was first introduced in Windows XP. Microsoft, amongst a whole other load of security researchers, have actually warned about um, remote desktop service and the use of it for um, being used by threat actors numerous times over the past few years. In 2019 alone, Microsoft released a set of two fixes for remote desktop services that included two critical ones um, using remote code execution, namely labeled the CVE 2019-1181 and CVE 2019-1182. One effective version of Windows was actually Windows 7, which as I think everybody's aware, actually went end of life January 2020. So both the vulnerabilities released by Microsoft required no user interaction whatsoever. And if exploited, essentially allowed the threat actor to gain access to install programs, view, change, delete data, and more importantly, could allow them to create a new user account that had a whole host of access rights, making these set of vulnerabilities super attractive to any threat actor that wanted to exploit them. More recently, in February this year, a lead pen tester, a company known as Raxis, actually released a new Metasploit module that was based on the timing vulnerability in Outlook web application. The vulnerability itself was essentially based on a discrepancy in how long it takes the web application to identify a fake logon versus one that is genuine. And during the kind of proving of that uh, vulnerability itself, the researcher actually showed what the discrepancy was and how kind of integral this was. So when the researcher entered a fake username, it took the system around four seconds to confirm that that username was incorrect. When they entered a genuine username, it actually took three milliseconds for the system to confirm that that was genuine. It might seem to us as humans kind of very small, but in terms of computing, this is massive. Essentially, building that into Metasploit would allow any you know, genuine pen tester, um, but even be more attractive to a threat actor, to use that tool in order to run it against the target system and look to gain access to that network by running a whole host of details against that particular targeted network. 
illustrate and I think why it's so popular for ransomware threat actors. A third and final case study looks at Bangkok Air, who many have probably read about in the last couple of weeks, who actually experienced a ransomware attack on the 23rd of August. To the airline's credit, and actually relatively unusual for someone who has experienced a ransomware attack, they admitted upfront that they had lost data due to the attack itself, including, again, a whole trove of sensitive information that was then sold on the dark web, including passenger names, contact information, and even partial credit card information as well. Bangkok Air did actually release what the ransom asked for was, and it was $50 million. So quite a significant difference from the group we were just talking about being a bad one. However, Bangkok Air did not pay that ransom, which did inevitably lead to the disclosure of the information that we have just mentioned. So it is still too early to understand how much this cyber attack will actually cost the airline, but given the release of personal data alone, it is likely that the revenue will decrease quite significantly. And a victim from 2019 um, called Demand actually cited that they had experienced an estimated loss of 95 million following them themselves falling victim to a ransomware attack. So third and finally, the group behind the attack on Bangkok Air was a group known as Lockbit 2.0, who have technically operated since 2019, but did have a brief hiatus and reappeared in June 2021. Since the reappearance sort of mid-year this year, the group have been associated with exploiting vulnerabilities in the Fortinet for Hello. Oh, I'm back. Just gave me a pause. Um, so, yeah. So the, the group themselves have targeted like FortiGate appliances in general. One particular one is the one that's on behind me, which is CVE 2018-13379. Again, exploited to try and gain access to victims' networks. So the vulnerability, when exploited does essentially allow a remote unauthenticated access to a system um, of the FortiGate appliance and, you know, prod that button, they could get things like configuration files and password files that are inherently within the appliance itself. Gathering those credentials could essentially allow a threat actor, either them themselves or even selling those credentials on to allow any threat actor whatsoever to regain access to that appliance as long as that um, appliance password is not changed in any way. Even three years after its initial disclosure in 2018, the vulnerability itself is still being used by threat actors to gain initial access to targeted company networks. I think this adeptly illustrate some of the challenges that we're talking about through the course of this presentation, where companies either just don't understand the importance of patching and looking at some of these vulnerabilities, especially the ones that are web facing, or just don't understand their own kind of exposure to these particular types of vulnerabilities. I think the job of every single one of us here to try and explain to people um, what that impact could well be. Just yesterday morning, Fortinet again confirmed that that vulnerability is still being targeted by threat actors. And there has been a threat actor advised by Fortinet who has managed to gather 87,000 credentials linked to Fortinet SSL VPN devices that have now been sold on the dark web. Whether those companies or not have patched that vulnerability if they haven't changed any of those credentials, that is essentially keys to the kingdom for any threat actor that is purchasing those details. This follows on from a, another report released by NCSC in sort of December 2020, that again, we're still preaching the fact that threat actors have tar are still targeting that vulnerability. With over 600 IPs, when they looked at the dark web, 
just being linked to the UK alone. Again, stressing to people that they should really be looking at these types of vulnerabilities and understanding their potential exposure to them themselves. So, so what? So what do all these attacks have in common? And the answer actually is ransomware as a service. Those that kind of haven't had a quick nap may have heard me mention ransomware as a service that I said that I'd mention later on in the presentation, and this is it. So essentially, ransomware as a service is a business model used by ransomware developers in which they lease variants in the same way as software as a service developers actually do legitimately. This service gives everybody, even people without any technical expertise or very little technical expertise, the ability to launch any ransomware attacks against a target of their choosing. The screenshot on the right hand side of the screen is actually taken from um, Lockbit 2.0's affiliate page, demonstrating sort of the professionalism of the group and actually shed some light on what affiliates in the group themselves offer and what they need to do in order to carry out a successful ransomware attack. So ransomware as a service is actually a massively growing economy as we kind of go through the years and a, a competitive one at that, as you can imagine, when ransomware operators are vying for attention and are vying for purchases. The total ransomware revenue in 2020 for ransomware as a service is thought to have been about $20 billion, up from $11.5 billion sort of the year before. Affiliate programs are only one model with many groups offering a monthly no commitment subscription, a one-time license fee, and finally, the ability to share any profit of any attack that's committed. So given this is a, such a competitive market and it is driving such a revenue for these groups themselves, it is no surprise that these groups have to continually find some way to gain some advantage over the other groups that are saturating this market at this point. One of those ways is actually to find vulnerabilities in networks and provide access and use of these to sort of their customers. As we've mentioned before, one of those is looking at picking up credentials for things like the Fortinet product that we just talked about with the 87,000 credentials. Other ways is just purely trying to scan the internet to find that hole in that company that they can poke and find their way in. Vulnerabilities themselves are not identified with a bone link to a threat group, APT, or even an active ransomware group in general. Vulnerabilities become entwined with these groups once they've been actively exploited in live real world attacks. The three examples behind me are actually open source scans that are carried out ooh, probably on Tuesday now on internet search engine Shodan and each provides a tiny little but really juicy insight into the problem that we're currently talking about. So namely that vulnerabilities can be identified from a simple search on the internet of any company around the globe whatsoever who is currently exposed to the internet through like their IP address with a group such as things like Lockbit and Avadan who have the know-how and the understanding of how to exploit these, using them as part of their service to gain this traction with the customers. So now we've freaked everybody out and you're all thinking, oh my God, we're all going to get attacked by ransomware and there's like, sod all we can do about it. Let's just take a step back and think about the kind of problem that I introduced at right at the top of this um, presentation. So what happens if we encourage the conversation around ransomware to change, and instead of purely focusing on those threat groups and the associated links to what they have been exploiting, we move the conversation on a little bit and start to encourage companies and security teams to understand the vulnerabilities that are currently out there being used, talked about on things like the dark web. 
and are lucky to be readily weaponized. So, I mean, as a threat intelligence specialist myself, I'm not saying that understanding the groups is not important. It absolutely is. But that's more when we're talking about understanding um, attacks on a kind of more global scale. So talking country to country um, in a similar way as our, our keynote did is absolutely valid. But when we're talking about ransomware, we do end up missing a little bit of a chunk of the puzzle because when we are talking about APTs, we are generally talking about motivation. So we do need to continue to focus on what is currently being exploited and what is being talked about by those um, threat actors. So actually, this is where threat intelligence can come hand in hand with anything that other teams are doing. Um, so if you have no TI team, then it's absolutely valid. There's whole sources out there from the likes of Intel 471 who have the ability to push out this information and talk about the vulnerabilities that are currently out there being used and are being readily weaponized. If you do have a TI team and they're not kind of doing this at the moment, just, just send them on this talk, send them my way, we can have that conversation sort of in general. So building on the previous point of why we need to focus more on the vulnerabilities themselves and less on just understanding the threat group in the background, that increase of ransomware over service means that threat actors and affiliates will completely make a service work for them. So it continues to render the old adage of motivation and capability in association with APTs a little bit down the pecking order. Because now those groups that ordinarily may have had the complete motivation to target a particular company, but have not had the technical expertise to do so, now have a whole criminal underground forum that is ready there and waiting to take the money and give them those tools that they need to be able to exploit that company. In practical terms, this means that tooling such as things like Cobalt Strike and Metasploit, when we're talking about emotion ransomware threat actors, absolutely remains a significant threat. But what we do need to start focusing on is those sort of internet facing gems that are out there that are ready, willing for the taking for those threat groups and understanding what that means for the customers and how to protect themselves. Recently, I think it was only last week, Lockbit 2.0 actually completed an interview with a, a security journalist where they were actually asked outright what companies could do to avoid falling victim to Lockbit themselves. They gave two key bits of advice. One of them was to have a kick-ass antivirus product and the second one was just to make sure that they update and patch all software regularly. I think adeptly kind of tying up this entire presentation that we've kind of just gone through. Oh, I thought I'd moved on a bit too far then. Um, so before we do uh, kind of kick into some of the advice that you've seen on the screen, um, I'll be upfront. This talk, I think unlike some of the other talks that are at VSI today, is not about reinventing the wheel. I am not going to suggest things like fancy AI firewalls that needs to be put into every part of the company and just obliterate your network or have your security team sat in some sort of bunker away from the Chinese and the Russians. No, absolutely not. We're going back to basics. Security 101, I think that everybody has kind of come around to some point in their career and we're just talking about keeping things secure. So with that in mind, and to keep a bit of an eye on the threat landscape and understand that ransomware as a service is increasing massively. You know, to date we have seen 600 vulnerabilities that have been released. Researchers think this is going to be over a thousand. Given this alone, it is important that companies have a great eye policy and program of understanding vulnerability management but not just saying, oh yeah, if a vulnerability comes out, I need to patch that because my policy told me to, but actually having the understanding to kind of step back and go, that's great, we can do that, 
but we need to understand what our risk is from our own organisation. So we, if we have 20 CVEs that are all internet facing, those are the ones that we're going to prioritise outside of the ones that are behind six firewalls and a network segmentation. So it's just having that understanding and thought process and kind of marrying that against what we've been talking about in terms of those threat actors that are having these conversations on the dark web and what are they talking about in conjunction with that. So linking to that kind of threat intelligence vibe and the provision of that and marrying everything together, you can use that type of threat intelligence of what threat actors are currently using, what they're exploiting, what's their tools and techniques and how are they doing some of this scanning and kind of equipping a great red team with it. They can take that information, use it, apply it to each of those organisations and basically come up with those strategies in conjunction with your TI team to make sure that you are keeping up to date and secure from those type of attacks. But that said, vulnerabilities are only just like one, albeit major part of the puzzle. Security defences are not infallible. You do also need to make sure that your employees understand the kind of things that are being leveraged against them. So things like emails that come into the organisation, and if somebody's trying to get into their system, how are they keeping their credentials secure and what are you doing to help them do that? And also build a culture of personal online security responsibility. So as I end the talk, if there's one thing that you take away from this, it's just keep it simple. If it's viewable from the internet, it's dangerous, it's being talked about, just for the love of God, patch it. So thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you for listening to my talk. I'm Kat. <laughs>
of what's happening and just making sure that there is some sort of understanding that yes they are going to continue they're going to try and continue to leverage that attacking and they need to then try and displace them somewhere else so we are seeing and actually because of that an increase in cyber threat for example of which we can start to concentrate on after that but yes ransomware threat actors are going to increase exponentially i think the uh, the, the hackers when you, you they give you the two pieces of information the mr third one uh, always ensure that you've got uh, backups uh, and especially uh, off-site absolutely yes that is 100 percent key any organization that has not paid the ransomware today has said that they've not done so because they have had off-site backups that they've been able to restore from so yeah absolutely agree cool thank you very much i think we've got time for a couple of questions so i'm very aware there's a break but i know there's going to be some spicy questions so chris <laughs> With your knowledge about all the money being made from ransomware, why haven't you gone to the dark side? Ooh, spicy. <laughs> I, I think it's just my pure love of threat intelligence and all things sort of white hat hacking. So I, I must say, my, my whole thing with threat intelligence, I am not a techie. So my understanding is purely people motivation. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why I love trying to stay ahead of what somebody is doing, trying to understand what their motivations are and trying to find ways to prevent them getting into any network that I'm currently protecting at this point. But yeah, I think I just don't quite have that too much of an evil side to go across to that. But who knows, another 10 years, <laughs> just keep an eye out. <laughs> Come to the dark side, they have cookies. Yes. Thanks for the talk. So the one of the root, like most obvious root cause from these case studies and from many others is like there are like the scenario is very similar. So there are known vulnerabilities out there, but companies are not patching them. Mm -hmm. And like if you look at a typical company organizational structure, you see like the engineering teams working on a on a, like a product or a feature. You see some security teams which keep saying that we need to patch and upgrade, but they are not yeah. empowered to do so. And like engineering teams usually like, oh, delay this to the next cycle. And if the upgrade fails because it interferes with, with the features, they delay it further. So it seems there is like some kind of organizational missing link here for engineering security tech people to actually walk through the security mm -hmm. issues and push the patches forward. So. What's your take on the like ideal organizational structure inside the uh, company which would support like active security patching, I would say? Oh, good question. Oh, to be honest, I think given the, my, my background, I'm pretty much going to say the threat intelligence. So you have to, on one hand, change the security kind of values and it starts from a top-down approach. So you need to get your board bought in of understanding why we need to do this and why it needs to be a priority to talk about security in this type of field. Whether, as you say, you're in the engineering team and just trying to get something done for the end customer, you do still need to have those conversations with security who may be like less reprimanding about patching if security is actually built in at the first few stages. So marrying those two together I think you do then need to have a vein of threat intelligence running through just to ensure that you can kind of have that covered. So when you have that conversation, your engineering team goes, well, it's going to take me a week longer to build that particular entrance. And you're like, well, would you rather take a week or would you rather then be smashed by ransomware and having to speak to your board and trying to get like $50 million out of them? So it's trying to balance those two thoughts and making sure that you're equipped with what you need to be in order to have those conversations. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the new hashtag for B-Size Newcastle should be smashed by ransomware. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Everybody give a round of applause. Thank you. Woo!